The Invisible Man by H. G. Wells. Chapter 21 In Oxford Street. In going downstairs the first time, I found an unexpected difficulty because I could not see my feet. Indeed, I stumbled twice, and there was an unaccustomed clumsiness in gripping the bolt. By not looking down, however, I managed to walk on the level possibly well. My mood, I say, was one of exultation. I felt as a seeing man might do with padded feet and noiseless clothes in a city of the blind. I experienced a, a wild impulse to jest, to startle people, to clap men on the back, fling people's hats astray, and generally revel in my extraordinary advantage. But hardly had I emerged upon Great Portland Street, however, my lodging was close to the big draper's shop there, when I heard a clashing concussion and was hit violently behind, and turning, saw a man carrying a basket of soda-water siphons, and looking in amazement at his burden. Although the blow had really hurt me, I found something so irresistible in his astonishment that I laughed aloud. "'The devil's in the basket,' I said, and suddenly twisted it out of his hand. He let go incontinently, and I swung the whole weight into the air. But a fool of a cabman, standing outside a public house, made a sudden rush for this, and his extending fingers took me with excruciating violence under the ear. I let the hole down with a smash on the cabman, and then, with shouts and the clatter of feet about me, people coming out of shops, vehicles pulling up, I realised what I had done for myself, and, cursing my folly, backed against a shop window and prepared to dodge out of the confusion. In a moment I should be wedged into a crowd and inevitably discovered. I pushed by a butcher boy, who luckily did not turn to see the nothingness that shoved him aside, and dodged behind the cabman's four-wheeler. I do not know how they settled the business. I hurried straight across the road, which was happily clear, and hardly heeding which way I went, in the fright of detection the incident had given me, plunged into the afternoon throng of Oxford Street. I tried to get into the stream of people, but they were too thick for me, and in a moment my heels were being trodden upon. I took to the gutter, the roughness of which I found painful to my feet, and forthwith the shaft of a crawling hansom dug me forcibly under the shoulder-blade reminding me that I was already bruised severely. I staggered out of the way of the cab, avoided a perambulator by a convulsive movement, and found myself behind the hansom. A happy thought saved me, and as this drove slowly along I followed in its immediate wake, trembling and astonished at the turn of my adventure. And not only trembling but shivering. It was a bright day in January, and I was stark naked, and the thin slime of mud that covered the road was freezing. Foolish as it seems to me now, I had not reckoned that, transparent or not, I was still amenable to the weather and all its consequences. Then suddenly a bright idea came into my head. I ran round and got into the cab. And so shivering, scared, and sniffing with the first intimations of a cold, and with the bruises in the small of my back growing upon my attention, I drove slowly along Oxford Street and past Tottenham Court Road. My mood was as different from that in which I had sallied forth ten minutes ago as it is possible to imagine. This invisibility, indeed! The one thought that possessed me was, how was I to get out of the scrape I was in? We crawled past Moody's, and there a tall woman with five or six yellow-labelled books hailed my cab, and I sprang out just in time to escape her, shaving a railway van narrowly in my flight. I made off up the roadway to Bloomsbury Square, intending to strike north past the museum and so get into the quiet district. I was now cruelly chilled, and the strangeness of my situation so unnerved me that I whimpered as I ran. At the northward corner of the square a little white dog ran out of the pharmaceutical society's offices, and incontinently made for me, nose down. I had never realised it before, but the nose is to the mind of a dog what the eye is to the mind of a seeing man. Dogs perceive the scent of a man moving, as men perceive his vision. This brute began barking and leaping, showing, as it seemed to me, only too plainly that he was aware of me. I crossed Great Russell Street, glancing over my shoulder as I did so, and went somewhere along Montague Street before I realised what I was running towards. Then I became aware of a blare of music, and looking along the street saw a number of people advancing out of Russell Square, red shirts and the banner of the Salvation Army to the fore. Such a crowd, chanting in the roadway and scoffing on the pavement, I could not hope to penetrate, and dreading to go back and further from home again, and deciding on the spur of the moment, I ran up the white steps of a house facing the museum railings, and stood there until the crowd should have passed. Happily the dog stopped at the noise of the band, too, 
hesitated and turned tail, running back to Bloomsbury Square again. On came the band, bawling with unconscious irony some hymn about when shall we see his face, and it seemed an interminable time to me before the tide of the crowd washed along the pavement but by me. Thud, thud, thud came the drum with a vibrating resonance, and for the moment I did not notice two urchins stopping at the railings by me. "'See em said one. "'See what?' said the other. "'Why, them footmarks, bare, like what he makes in mud.' I looked down, and saw the youngsters had stopped, and were gaping at the muddy footmarks I had left behind me up the newly whitened steps. The passing people elbowed and jostled them, but their confounded intelligence was arrested. "'Thud, thud, thud, when, thud, shall we see, thud, his face, thud, thud. "'There's a barefoot man gone up them steps, or I don't know nothing,' said one. "'And he ain't never come down again, and his foot was a-bleeding.' The thick of the crowd had already passed. "'Looky here, Ted!' quoth one of the younger of the detectives, with the sharpness of surprise in his voice, and pointed straight to my feet. I looked down and saw at once the dim suggestion of their outline sketched in splashes of mud. For a moment I was paralysed. "'Why, that's rum,' said the elder. "'Dashed rum! It's like the ghost of a foot, ain't it?' He hesitated and advanced with outstretched hand. A man pulled up short to see what he was catching, and then a girl. In another moment he would have touched me. Then I saw what to do. I made a step. The boy started back with an exclamation, and with a rapid movement I swung myself over into the portico of the next house. But the smaller boy was sharp-eyed enough to follow the movement, and before I was well down the steps and upon the pavement, he had recovered from his momentary astonishment and was shouting out that the feet had gone over the wall. They rushed round and saw my new footmarks flash into being upon the lower step and upon the pavement. "'What's up?' asked someone. "'Feet! Look! Feet! Running!' Everybody in the road except my three pursuers was pouring along after the Salvation Army, and this blow not only impeded me, but them. There was an eddy of surprise and interrogation. At the cost of bowling over one young fellow I got through, and in another moment I was rushing headlong round the circuit of Russell Square, with six or seven astonished people following my footmarks. There was no time for explanations, or else the whole host would have been after me. Twice I doubled round corners, thrice I crossed the road and came back upon my tracks, and then as my feet grew hot and dry, the damp impressions began to fade. At last I had a breathing space and rubbed my feet clean with my hands, and so got away altogether. The last I saw of the chase was a little group of a dozen people, perhaps, studying with infinite perplexity a slowly drying footprint that had resulted from a puddle in Tavistock Square, a footprint as isolated and incomprehensible to them as Crusoe's solitary discovery. This running warmed me to a certain extent, and I went on with a better courage through the maze of less frequented roads that runs hereabouts. My back had now become very stiff and sore, my tonsils were painful from the cabman's fingers, and the skin of my neck had been scratched by his nails. My feet hurt exceedingly, and I was lame from a little cut on one foot. I saw in time a blind man approaching me, and fled limping, for I feeled his subtle intuitions. Once or twice accidental collisions occurred, and I left people amazed with unaccountable curses ringing in their ears. And then something silent and quiet against my face and across the square fell a thin veil of slowly falling flakes of snow. I had caught a cold, and do as I would I could not avoid an occasional sneeze. And every dog that came in sight with its pointed nose and curious sniffing was a terror to me. Then came men and boys running, first one and then others, and shouting as they ran. It was a fire. They ran in the direction of my lodging, and looking back down a street I saw a mass of black smoke streaming up above roofs and telephone wires. It was my lodging burning, my clothes, my apparatus, all my resources indeed except my cheque-book and the three volumes of memoranda that awaited me in Great Portland Street were there. Burning. I had burnt my boats, if ever a man did. The place was blazing. The invisible man paused and thought. Kemp glanced nervously out of the window. Yes, he said. Go on. Chapter 22 In the Emporium so, last January, with the beginning of a snowstorm in the air about me, and if it settled on me it would betray me, weary, cold, painful, inexpressibly wretched, and still but half convinced of my invisible quality, 
I began this new life to which I am committed. I had no refuge, no appliances, no human being in the world in whom I could confide. To have told my secret would have given me away, made a mere show and rarity of me. Nevertheless, I was half-minded to accost some passer-by and throw myself upon his mercy. But I knew too clearly the terror and brutal cruelty my advances would evoke. I made no plans in the street. My sole object was to get shelter from the snow, to get myself covered and warm. Then I might hope to plan. But even to me, an invisible man, the rows of London houses stood latched, barred, and bolted impregnably. Only one thing could I see clearly before me, the cold exposure and misery of the snowstorm and night. And then I had a brilliant idea. I turned down one of the roads leading from Gower Street to Tottenham Court Road, and found myself outside Omiums, a big establishment where everything is to be bought. You know the place, meat, grocery, linen, furniture, clothing, oil paintings even, a huge meandering collection of shops rather than a shop. I thought I should find the doors open, but they were closed, and as I stood in the wide entrance a carriage stopped outside, and a man in uniform, you know, the kind of personage with omnium on his cap, flung open the door. I contrived to enter, and walking down the shop, it was a department where they were selling ribbons and gloves and stockings and that kind of thing, came to a more spacious region devoted to picnic baskets and wicker furniture. I did not feel safe there, however. People were going to and fro, and I prowled restlessly until I came about a huge section in an upper floor containing multitudes of bedsteads, and over these I clambered and found a resting place at last among a huge pile of folded flock mattresses. The place was already lit up and agreeably warm, and I decided to remain where I was, keeping a cautious eye on the two or three sets of shopmen and customers who were meandering through the place until closing time came. Then I should be able, I thought, to rob the place for food and clothing, and disguised, prowl through it and examine its resources, perhaps sleep on some of the bedding. That seemed an acceptable plan. My idea was to procure clothing to make myself a muffled but acceptable figure, to get money, and then to recover my books and parcels where they awaited me, take a lodging somewhere, and elaborate plans for the complete realisation of the advantages my invisibility gave me, as I still imagined, over my fellow men. Closing time arrived quickly enough. It could not have been more than an hour after I took up my position on the mattress before I noticed the blinds of the windows being drawn, and customers being marched doorward. And then a number of brisk young men began with remarkable alacrity to tidy up the goods that remained disturbed. I left my lair as the crowds diminished, and prowled cautiously out into the less desolate parts of the shop. I was really surprised to observe how rapidly the young men and women whipped away the goods displayed for sale during the day. All the boxes of goods, the hanging fabrics, the festoons of lace, the boxes of sweets in the grocery section, the displays of this and that were being whipped down, folded up, slapped into tidy receptacles, and everything that could not be taken down and put away had sheets of some coarse stuff like sacking flung over them. Finally, all the chairs were turned up on the counters, leaving the floor clear. Directly each of these young people had done, he or she made promptly for the door, with such an expression of animation as I have rarely observed in a shop assistant before. Then came a lot of youngsters, scattering sawdust and carrying pails and brooms. I had to dodge to get out of the way, and as it was, my ankle got stung with the sawdust. For some time, wandering through the swathed and darkened departments, I could hear the brooms at work, and at last, a good hour or more after the shop had been closed, came a noise of locking doors. Silence came upon the place, and I find myself wandering through the vast and intricate shops, galleries, showrooms of the place, alone. It was very still. In one place I remember passing near one of the Tottenham Court Road entrances, and listening to the tapping of boot-heels of the passers-by. My first visit was to the place where I had seen stockings and gloves for sale. It was dark, and I had the devil of a hunt after matches, which I found at last in the drawer of the little cash-desk. Then I had to get a candle. I had to tear down wrappings and ransack a number of boxes and drawers, but at last I managed to turn out what I sought. The box label called them lamb's wool pants and lamb's wool vests, then socks, a thick comforter, and then I went to the clothing place and got trousers, a lounge jacket, an overcoat, and a slouch hat, a clerical sort of hat with the brim turned down. I began to feel a human being again, and my next thought was food. Upstairs was a refreshment department, and there I got cold meat. There was coffee still in the urn, and I lit the gas and warmed it up again, and altogether I did not do badly. 
Afterwards, prowling through the place in search of blankets, I had to put up at last with a heap of down quilts, I came upon a grocery section with a lot of chocolate and candied fruits, more than was good for me indeed, and some white burgundy. And near that was a toy department, and I had a brilliant idea. I found some artificial noses, dummy noses, you know, and I thought of dark spectacles. But Omniums had no optical department. My nose had been a difficulty indeed. I had thought of paint, but the discovery set my mind running on wigs and masks and the like. Finally I went to sleep in a heap of down quilts, very warm and comfortable. My last thoughts before sleeping were the most agreeable I had had since the change. I was in a state of physical serenity, and that was reflected in my mind. I thought that I should be able to slip out unobserved in the morning with my clothes upon me, muffling my face with a white wrapper I had taken, purchased with the money I had taken, spectacles and so forth, and so complete my disguise. I lapsed into disorderly dreams of all the fantastic things that had happened during the last few days. I saw the ugly little Jew of a landlord vociferating in his rooms. I saw his two sons marvelling, and the wrinkled old woman's gnarled face as she asked for her cat. I experienced again the strange sensation of seeing the cloth disappear, and so I came round to the windy hillside and the sniffing old clergyman mumbling earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust at my father's open grave. "'You also,' said a voice, and suddenly I was being forced towards the grave. I struggled, shouted, appealed to the mourners, but they continued stonily following the service, the old clergyman too, never faltering, droning, and sniffling through the ritual. I realised I was invisible and inaudible, that overwhelming forces had their grip on me. I struggled in vain, I was forced over the brink, the coffin rang hollow as I fell upon it, and the gravel came flying after me in spadefuls. Nobody heeded me, nobody is aware of me. I made convulsive struggles and awoke. The pale London dawn had come. The place was full of a chilly grey light that filtered around the edges of the window blinds. I sat up, and for a time I could not think where this ample apartment with its counters, its piles of rolled stuff, its hilp of quilts and cushions, its iron pillars might be. Then as recollection came back to me I heard voices in conversation. Then far down the place, in the brighter light of some department which had already raised its blinds, I saw two men approaching. I scrambled to my feet, looking about me for some way of escape, and even as I did so the sound of my movement made them aware of me. I suppose they saw merely a figure moving quietly and quickly away. "'Who's that?' cried one, and "'Stop there!' cried the other. I dashed around a corner and came full tilt, a faceless figure, mind you, on a lanky lad of fifteen. He yelled and I bowled him over, rushed past him, turned another corner, and by happy inspiration threw myself behind a counter. In another moment feet went running past, and I heard voices shouting, "'All hands to the doors!' asking what was up, and giving one another advice how to catch me. Lying on the ground I felt scared out of my wits, but, odd as it may seem, it did not occur to me at that moment to take off my clothes as I should have done. I had made up my mind, I suppose, to get away in them, and that ruled me. And then down the vista of the counters came a bawling of, "'Here he is!' I sprang to my feet, whipped a chair off the counter, and sent it whirling at the fool who had shouted, turned, came into another round a corner, sent him spinning, and rushed up the stairs. He kept his footing, gave a view halloo, and came up the staircase hot after me. Up the staircase were piled a multitude of those bright-coloured pot things. What are they? Art pots, suggested Kemp. That's it, art pots. Well, I turned at the top step and swung round, plucked one out of a pile, and smashed it on his silly head as he came at me. The whole pile of pots went headlong, and I heard shouting and footsteps running from all parts. I made a mad rush for the refreshment place, and there was a man in white, like a man-cook, who took up the chase. I made one last desperate turn and found myself among lamps and ironmongery. I went behind the counter of this and waited for my cook, and as he bolted in at the head of the chase I doubled him up with a lamp. Down he went, and I crouched down behind the counter and began whipping off my clothes as fast as I could. Coat, jacket, trousers, shoes were all right, but a lamb's wool vest fits a man like a skin. I heard more men coming. My cook was lying quiet on the other side of the counter, stunned or scared speechless, and I had to make another dash for it, like a rabbit hunted out of a woodpile. "'This way, policeman!' I heard someone shouting, and I found myself in my bedstead storeroom again, and at the end of a wilderness of wardrobes. I rushed among them, went flat, got rid of my vest after infinite wriggling, and stood a free man again panting and scared, as the policeman and three of the shopmen came round the corner. They made a rush for the vest and pants, and collared the trousers. "'He's dropping his plunder,' said one of the young men. "'He must be somewhere here.' 
but they did not find me all the same. I stood watching them hunt for me for a time, and cursing my ill luck in losing the clothes. Then I went into the refreshment room, drank a little milk I found there, and sat down by the fire to consider my position. In a while, two assistants came in and began to talk over the business very excitedly, and like the fools they were. I heard a magnified account of my depredations and other speculations as to my whereabouts. Then I fell to scheming again. The insurmountable difficulty of the place, especially now it was alarmed, was to get any plunder out of it. I went down into the warehouse to see if there was any chance of packing and addressing a parcel, but I could not understand the system of checking. About eleven o'clock, the snow having thawed as it fell, and the day being finer and a little warmer than the previous one, I decided that the emporium was hopeless, and went out again, exasperated at my want of success, with only the vaguest plans of action in my mind. End of chapter 22 Recorded in Nottingham, England on the 9th of April 2006 by Alex Foster, www.alexfoster.me.uk